Cameron Turner, and I'm the VP of Data Science for Kin and Carta. Um, despite being from the Bay Area, I'm not Steve Kerr's awkward little brother, although many people have accused me of being that. Um, I get the pleasure today of talking to you about the work that the labs team is doing at Kin and Carta. The labs at Kin and Carta were set up to experiment with new technologies and use cases to reduce the operational and financial risk that our client organizations have. By working together, we generate prototypes and we work with these things in order to understand what the risks are such that when we show up on site with our client, that risk is lower and we're able to accelerate time to production. So not surprisingly, we've been looking at generative AI very closely. In fact, I was telling someone before the show, when we planned this event, we were wondering what use cases to talk about because at that moment, there was no trusted way to deploy generative AI into the enterprise and since then, in the last several weeks at a, a pace that really all of us are stunned by, as you heard from Megan and Tom, um, these things are, are becoming real. Uh, they're going out, they're becoming real use cases. So there's plenty of opportunity out there. There's plenty of caution required in how you do that. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do today is share with you three uh, examples. Um, I don't have time to talk in detail about any of them, so my hope is that during the happy hour which follows this, we can get together, anyone that wants to talk about it or just brainstorm, that's why we're here. Um, and I love these events, I love Tom's comments and Megan's comments because it helps contextualize the work that we do and help us understand really what's going on out there. To start out, I wanna just take a quick historical context on sort of where we are and where does Gen AI sort of fit into this picture just to extend some of the thoughts that Tom had, which were fantastic. Uh, so if we go back, you know, over a century, think about the Industrial Revolution, what was the goal of automation? It was really taking what was previously done through perspiration of women and men and animals, and instead doing that with steel and steam, and ultimately really upping uh, what the output looked like. And I chose this picture because it really is the basis of the retail industry. We would not have retail in the way that we think about it today. Uh, without that kind of automation and that really uh, huge step forward in terms of what production looked like. If we move forward to the 1980s, 1990s, the PC revolution, obviously we had computing before that, but PCs really made accessible a lot of what computers can do. The humble for loop, anyone who's written any code or took a class in, in high school, does amazing things for us, infinite loops to provide uh, output uh, without any additional coding, without any additional testing, it's all contained right there. And so PCs did something really special. They opened up all of that computing power to, to all of us and enabled us to do that on our desktop. Obviously that extended into mobile, the internet was a huge thing. But one of the really important things and maybe the most important thing that the PC revolution gave us is data. Because when we started working with these devices and we started working with this software and we started interacting with websites, we started creating data. We started creating signal. And that signal could be consumed in order to create automation. And that automation could then be optimized. And that's really where the industrial use of machine learning really picked up. So going forward, if we think about like where we are, or I guess where we were a year ago, we think about AI and machine learning. It's really about moving from having all that data out there, and how do you use algorithms in order to refine and hone and hone and hone, exactly how Tom described it. Instead of looking at a thousand televisions, give me just the one. Give me just the, inform just the one that I need to look at. If I'm a physician, I, cannot, I can access not just my own patient's health records, I essentially have access to all of the care pathways that have ever been used by any physician in my field, and I can recommend a care pathway for my patient based on that knowledge and those outcomes. Um, and so machine learning and AI are all about that. The, the algorithms themselves go back to 1943. Uh, McCulloch and Pitts published a white paper um, that was using circuits in order to sort of simulate what was going on inside of the synapses of the mind. But what we didn't have then was the compute power. We didn't have the ability to consume that data and do much with it. So fast forward to now, and if you've seen uh, what's happened with NVIDIA becoming a trillion dollar company in the last week, um, that's all based on this compute power, which we can now hydrate with that data and generate outcomes that have never been seen before. Um, so that's really uh, fundamentally where you know, AI and, and uh, the business value started to really, really flow out. But again, all of that was about honing down, getting to that one television, that one answer, that best care pathway. Why has Gen AI captured the imagination for all of us? 
Well, firstly, because it married large language models with, with a very natural interface, chat. We can ask, we can access that corpus, we can pull information, and then we can generate optimizations. But if we go forward one slide, it's really our ability to uh, expand our thinking. It's about creativity and innovation. And this is a really important point because there's a lot of debate right now. Is AI becoming sentient? It seems to answer the questions that I ask it in a way cre that's creative and has never been answered before. If we click one more. So this is one I ran last night with my daughter. A Van Gogh painting of a picture. This is with Dolly. And immediately it will create. And it'll create permutations and combinations of what I've provided. Go forward again, please. Different views. This is Van Gogh painting a picture of himself inside of his own painting. Something that doesn't exist in the world. And it'll create it again and again with different variations. What that gives me is the ability as a human to then choose correct outcomes. So instead of honing in on one single thing, Gen AI does the opposite. It expands our horizons. It gives us a new area to explore really important in retail from a design standpoint, from an e-commerce standpoint, from a brick and mortar and experience standpoint. But how does this apply to retail? So let's, um, let's think about this customer that you have. She's visiting your website. Um, she actually came uh, because she wants to search for, she only has uh, one pearl earring, so she needs another pearl earring. So she types in uh, pearl earring, if things had gone well, she would basically, uh, you know, have found that. Maybe some variations and different sizes, different, um, you know, prices for that, that, that earring. But what does Gen AI do for us? Gen AI starts to paint out. This is called out painting. This is an actual image that was done. Um, the internal was just what you saw before was the, the original. Everything else was generated from Dolly. So Dolly took just that information, that one image, and took a guess. And this is what you can do with large language models, with that corpora that's been uh, established out there. And when you train a model against that, it can predict not just the next word, not just the next paragraph, but the whole book, the whole life, if you want it to. It'll just keep going. Um, and so outpainting is an example of that. But in the e-commerce standpoint, look what she's chosen. She visited your site. She went for the, uh, you know, the manual coffee grinder. She got the matching teacups up there. She got a silk flower pot. Um, and I think like a 1950s uh, vintage microphone. I'm not sure exactly what that is. But, um, but anyway, the point is that as these experiences evolve, what we'll see is the ability to uh, provide more and more to our customers. And it literally will expand the canvas of opportunity, what we can do for those clients in any given interaction. I think that's one of the most powerful things about Gen AI is that, is that expansion. So again, thinking about retail, I want to share with you some of what we're seeing already in the market. Um, so first, um, you know, obviously affecting customer interactions. Brand is no longer a standard that you're trying to set in your market. It's a relationship, and it's a unique relationship, bespoke to the individual that you're interacting with. So my experience of the Starbucks brand is completely different than Megan's experience of the Starbucks brand, probably because she's right there. But you know. Uh, and so you know, really all of us have a, our own brand experience. So that really changes the fundamentals um, of what, what it means in retail. Going forward, thinking about your people, your employees. How do you give those people superpowers to enable them to do their job better? AI is not going to replace people. It will empower them. It will let them do more. It will let them do more creative work. It will give them more options. It will give them more signal, more information to do what they do best. So enabling that creativity, enabling that broader canvas is really fundamental to what you can do with AI. And finally, as we think about partners and supply chain, um, at Kid and Carta, we think a lot about sustainability um, as a B Corp, both from the standpoint of resilient revenue that you generate for your organization, um, but also in terms of thinking about efficiency in the supply chain. When you have a more efficient supply chain, you have less waste, you have less CO2. So all of that comes together. Now the good news, to all these three things is none of this is new. You guys are all the experts in all three of these areas already. So these tools are basically meant to support what you're already doing and enable you to do it better. And the technology, um, not to say Gen AI replaces AI or replaces machine learning or replaces any other approach, BI for example, it's really about using the right tool for the right job. Um, and you have consultants, please help. let us help you. You have partners through your technology platforms who are there to support all of that, but you are the expert. 
Okay, so I'm gonna drop into three quick examples. So um, this is a real one. Uh, so imagine uh, you are a field service manager for an equipment rental company that rents out construction equipment all over the country. Um, you're sitting in your second floor office and you're looking out your window on a Tuesday morning and you've got all of this equipment out there. Um, this equipment um, you know, is in different state, states of health and ultimately what you wanna do is understand where do you direct your field service team in order to have the biggest impact? The game you're playing is reducing downtime for any of this equipment in order to optimize revenue. When a machine goes down on the job site, your company loses revenue, loses brand value. So where do you deploy them? How do you do that? Do you use, do it based on what you know? The challenges with these different equipment, where they've been, looking back through work orders and trying to understand what the risk might be? So what we've built in this example is uh, marrying really three things, augmented reality, uh, machine learning, and, uh, and generative AI. Um, on the machine learning side, the first challenge for us and what we've achieved so far is creating a score. So a zero to 100 score for the health of that piece of equipment. That's generated based on the diagnostic trouble codes that come off of these machines as they're in operation. So the same as in your car, if your oil light goes on. Um, those kinds of codes, we can collect that dynamically we can use that as fodder combined with history of what failures have looked like in order to generate a probability of whether or not that piece of equipment will fail in the next seven days. And then the inverse of that is the health. So very simple, uh, very explainable to Megan's point that we can always pull up exactly why, what are the contributing factors? Is it that it's this type of equipment? Is it that it's this type of climate? Is it this type of customer? Um, all those things can come into bear. But critically, where do you go from here? So we know that one of these lift, sorry, if you go back one, one of these lift booms is a health of 12. We can dig in, we can kind of see why. But what's gonna work to remedy that situation? It has oil, low oil pressure, let's say. So for that particular uh, machine, what we can do is take the, the corpora of all of the history of the work orders and combine that in order to tell a recommendation of exactly what to do. Um, and that's where it becomes dynamic. It's like talking to the expert, not about equipment in general, but that particular machine, uh, which is a fascinating new space. The second example comes from AgTech, um, and this is a pilot that we're working on right now uh, for agronomists. Agronomists work alongside farmers to do optimizations for exactly what's get, what gets done to crops and when. Um, so in this case, we're using public information, USDA information, California public records uh, for product usage uh, reports that are required by law that you publish in that say exactly what kind of product, what kind of chemical goes into a field at exactly which coordinates, which is important because now you're back to a pers very personalized uh, context. Um, so using generative AI, we can develop literally a whisper in the ear of the agronomist that's telling them answers to their questions as they're working in the field. These people have dirt on their hands. They're not able to sit in front of a laptop and, and type their request and, um, and think about things. Oftentimes, just having the right form factor and being able to provide information and signal at the right time can empower your agronomist who's in the field to be the super-powered super expert to their client. Um, and that's uh, you know, what we're all about with, with data. And finally, the third example, um, working with Tom's team. Uh, this is something we've just started to look a little bit at. Uh, so U.S. Foods has uh, pulled this off the public site. 400,000 SKUs, I think, Tom, somewhere in that neighborhood. Maybe that's an old number. Okay, I, yeah, I'm dated. So close to a million uh, uh, product SKUs. Um, so what do you do when you run an e-commerce site with a million different SKUs on it and you wanna have a great experience for anyone who visits the page for any one of those? Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, luckily, we, we, know, we know a lot about the, about the products. We have the ingredients, we have base descriptions and so forth, but how do we convert that into something um, that's useful uh, from a consumer standpoint and really delivers a 21st century experience? Um, so this is just an example. Um, this is a no-code experiment that we did. Um, if you click through the build on this one, Mike, yeah, so some of the things that you'll see inside the site, the most critical one is in the upper uh, right for you, which is data security. Um, this is a really important point that many companies are, are getting wrong. When you type something into ChatGPT, you're interacting with an LLM through a public interface. Your data is going into that interface. When you're operating inside the tenant of your cloud service provider, that's yours. So that's the same as sending and receiving email. So a very important context. Any experimentation, you wanna be, be behind that wall. The custom parameters let you, uh, let, let you tailor the output um, and so forth. 
But ultimately, our goal is going from uh, the facts, which are very important, to something that's ready to be read by a chef and something that reads like professional marketing language. And I think we were pretty impressed with this. Why does this work so well? And there's a few examples you can just click through here, Mike. But why does this work so well? Well, because what the internet is. It's a lot of product descriptions. So actually, there's a lot of information out there about how to write great product descriptions, even if your products aren't listed you know, in the same format. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. So look for that, you know, where the water is running today. And, and, and if you could follow that, you can do very well uh, based, on, based on what's out there. All right, so just to wrap up here, um, just some takeaway points. Uh, ultimately, simplicity is very important in execution. So finding use cases, uh, focusing on the outcome. There's a lot of hype going on out there. There's a lot of things about how everything will change and nothing will be as it was. I think a lot of things will be the same as they were. They'll just be better. And I think that's one of the things that uh, we're finding with the application of these use cases. So thinking big, starting small, um, you know, having a plan, having a strategy, having a roadmap, understanding your data foundation and where you're going with that is very important. Being able to do something today, prove demonstrable ROI inside of weeks and not months is critical. Because all of us, I think, are kind of bought on. You wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in the topic. Not everyone is. And a lot of people are skeptical and a lot of people are trying to shut it down as well. So really you have to prove, and all of us are in the business of trying to prove it as we go. Um, so that really comes down to, to starting small, delivering value, and then growing from there. Um, Tom talked a lot about this, so I won't, I won't say much more about it, but really, you know, think about data quality, think about data governance, think about data management, um, think about your data retention policy and how that relates to your overall standards. These are all things that um, are, are super important, all foundational work. You can build POCs and experiments with static data, sure. But when you want to demonstrate and scale that value over time, it requires a data foundation. So that's really uh, you know, where we spend, I would say, the majority of our time. And, and as Megan pointed out, too, the machine learning piece is that little box in the middle. It's the fun part. Super fun. But you do that after you do all the other things. Um, people in process, another critical thing. How do you prevent a great POC, even with a great data foundation, from becoming shelfware by being put aside? Think about the people, think about the process. How are you aligning to people's current incentives in the current model? Are you gonna to try to change that in order to make your thing work? Or do you snap into it and identify ways to empower and grow the current system? Um, and I think the latter, at least in the short term, is always proves, proves to be the winner. And finally, uh, be bold, try things out, experiment. Um, and I think you know, e-commerce and retail has this sort of baked in. We have ABN testing baked in. We have the idea of you know, trying things out and field testing, um, doing you know, sample markets. Like all that's built into the, to the industry. It's not true everywhere. Um, but I think ultimately it's about taking a step. Find a, find a use case. Try something out. Um, the platforms are there. The technologies are there. Uh, and the people are there your consultants, your partners, um, and, and all your, your great uh, people internally who I'm sure are all playing with this as well, are all ready to get excited and, and work on this stuff. So that's it. Um, I just wanna close with one thought, which is a reminder, you are the expert. So you know, I think there's a lot of like you know, deluge of technical this and that about generative AI. Ultimately, when it comes to retail, you're the expert on your market, you're the expert on your customers, you're the expert of your supply chain, you're the expert of your people. So take all that knowledge and bring that to bear in terms of the solutions that you build. Thank you.